Open up your Bibles, John chapter 3, we're going to continue on. We saw where Jesus had that conversation with Nicodemus, and we were talking about many things in that, but now it goes on from that point, beginning in John chapter 3, verse 22. So if you have your Bibles, turn there, and we will start reading from that point. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now that was where John the Baptist was in that area. Then it says this, Now John also was baptizing in Anon and Salim because there was much water there. That is north now. So he has moved north from where he was. And I believe, think about this, he says Jesus is it and now he starts getting out of the way. He starts moving out. Jesus is coming into the same area where he was and he starts baptizing uh, uh, there. And in verse 25, then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And we find out in the next chapter, those Jews were connected with the Pharisees. So basically the Pharisees are trying to stir something up here. And basically it, it, it basically was something like this. Uh, you said you were doing a baptism of repentance and they could come and do all that and be baptized for that. And now here's somebody else, another type of ministry, and he's baptizing. And so apparently yours isn't good enough. Ha apparently yours isn't purifying because now this guy's doing this. So what you were doing uh, uh, isn't working. Let me ask you a question. Do you think the Pharisees were for Jesus? They weren't for Jesus, right? And we know they weren't for John. They didn't go to John's baptism. They don't like either one. They don't like a move of God, period. But they'll love to see the groups fight each other. If they can stir up something between one group and the other and make them fight, they're just happy because they don't want to do what either one of them's doing. They'd rather see a good fight than have a good repentance. Right? And it'll, it'll, it'll ease my heart if you guys are fighting one another and I can say, see how they are. See how they are. Well, the Pharisees sent people into the group and was questioning the validity of that ministry and what is going on. Your purification, your, your repentance apparently wasn't good enough because this guy's starting. He's doing baptism. So uh, what, your baptism didn't work? I, I know that's what they're stirring up. Then it says, uh, uh, verse 26, and they, these are the disciples of John, having had that discussion, are now coming to John. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi... He who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing. And all are coming to him. Now see, already they're wrong. Because all can't be coming to him if John had to get where there was much water so he could do baptism. There's plenty of people still coming to John. They're not all going to Jesus, but more of them are going to Jesus than to John. But John still had to find where there's much water. Now, this has nothing to do with the message, but this is just a little thing for you. <laughs> if God has called you to a baptism ministry, you better get where there's water. Does that make sense? So if you have been called by God to do something, how come you're not in the place that it can happen? Some of us, we got a call, but we won't put ourselves where it can happen. We won't put ourselves in the place, in the flow. We won't, get, you know, we won't say, let's go to it. Let's put our hands. You know, we'll say, yeah, 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 I, I feel it, but I'm going to hang around. I'm, I'm bumming around out here, you know. Vacation is great, but it's got to end sometime. And, and you go to where you can do the ministry God has called you. And God called him to a ministry of baptism of repentance. And so he said, Jesus is the one. He's moving out of Judea, but he still goes to a place where there's plenty of water because he's still doing ministry. And you have to go where you can do ministry. God's called us to minister. And, and where, if where you're at is impossible, then you need to get to where it can happen if that's what God has on your heart. Uh, that's all I'm saying. That's a little side note. You can do what you want to do with it. <laughs> if, you're that, if, if water's in your ministry, get to where there's water. Okay? Simple as that. So they say that uh, he's baptizing more and everybody's going to him. And, and that was a false narrative because people aren't all going to him. But doesn't that sound very familiar? We speak in absolutes. 
especially when we're turning on somebody, uh, when we're saying something's going on, all of them, everything, you know, and we just make it like it's the, the most uh, all-encompassing thing, and that's what they're doing to John about Jesus' ministry. Uh, they still have all these people coming, they're doing baptism, and they are speaking as if nothing is going on. Like they've all left to that other place and that other ministry. And John answered and said, A man cannot receive, can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. Did you hear that one? What is John's response to them trying to get in this fight? He says, nobody has anything except God gives it to them. You know, that would help us a lot. If we can understand that everything that's happening to us is coming from God. Everything good that is going on every, is empowered by God himself. You didn't make it. You didn't design it. You couldn't create it. You can't sustain it. It is God and God alone. And so here comes people trying to stir up and get the churches fighting. And John's response is, you know what? Whatever's happening to them that is of God is of God. Everything that's going on. If that ministry is rising up, it's because God let it rise up. If our ministry is diminishing, it's because God's letting it diminish. It is not for me to make, create, to sustain any of it. It is for me to follow God. And to follow after him with my whole heart. And let him do with the vessel what he's going to do. If this is our moment to shine, if this is our mountaintop, then let it be our mountaintop. If it's time that we're going down, then let it be the time we're going down. But let God still be served and true in our heart and our life. He says, if God didn't give it to us, then what can we do? You can't force it. You can't make it. And there's no need being mad at somebody else that it's going on in. We need to figure that out in, in walking with one another. You know, you may hear me say that there's honest brothers and sisters that I don't agree with on certain subjects that we teach. I'm just telling you that I'm not where they are. So you may hear them, a different people, in a different place than I am. They're still in the kingdom. They're still doing something in the kingdom. God is still using them. It may be greater, it may be lesser, but the, my point is, God's taking me to a certain place, and to walk with God, I have to be true to my own heart in that walk. As a matter of fact, God's expecting me to be true to my own heart and to use me in the way that that is. But if I then say I'm going to attack any ministry and whatever, and it's all about bringing them down, I'm no longer of the Spirit of Christ. Remember when the disciples came and said, hey, that guy's out there, he's doing stuff in your name, but he's not with our group. Did Jesus go over and beat the dude up? Did he start criticizing him, putting him down, and destroying him? He said, hey, he who is not against us is for us. Speaking about the message of Christ. So I have to understand it. So I, I speak honestly in the places that I know I'm reading the word that some in the body of Christ do not agree with what I'm saying. But I do not want to teach us as a people that the Spirit of God would somehow attack difference. You know, we're all in the, the body of Christ. You know, there, there's one place that there's many things that they do that I would not do. I could not do, honestly, here. But you know what? I had a friend I could not reach. Couldn't reach the friend. Uh, you know, it just wasn't happening. And then guess what? That church, that fellowship reached him. So hallelujah, you know, angels rejoiced in heaven. You know, there was rejoicing in heaven for any soul that comes. That's a celebration time. Just like if somebody comes here, it's celebration time. We rejoice and thank God somebody knew. So, so I get that and I rejoice that hallelujah. You know what? It's not for where I'm at, but it was for him and praise God for it. You know, they may not be moving as fast and the others may be moving faster. It's, it's, that's not our concern. Our concern is what is God telling us? What's, what's God asking for our fellowship to do? We should rally around that and we should get involved and we should get it done. We, we should be a part of it, of what God is, is doing. All right. This, this is for somebody, something, you know. It's just wh whatever. But, you know, Pastor Marvin, we do the meet the pastors. And, and at the, you know, that's where people come. They may, they've been here for a while, and they want to know. 
And every time in that place, I, we end it by, I, I say to them, now, if you're coming here because you like the buildings and you like the whatever and whatever you think about it, if you're coming here because of that, I said, you're in the wrong place. And I say, if you're coming here because you like that you, you were greeted and it just felt good and you just feel good everywhere, just feel good, if that's why you're coming. I said, you're in the wrong place. If you're coming because you, you like the music and you think this music really suits who you are, and I, I just say, you're in the wrong place. And if you're coming because you say, well, Pastor Rick, I like your preaching. That's the kind of preaching I want and all that. Well, if that's why you're coming, you're in the wrong place. I said, now, if you're coming because God told you to be here, then you're in the right place. Yeah. Don't come because you're mad at somebody. <laughs> Something didn't go your way. Oh, I don't like that preacher or don't like this. Don't like that. Don't, don't leave, come, and move because of those things. Then you're being led by your flesh. You're being led by the emotions you have to deal with. But if God says, then you can go. And you can do. And you can be in a place. And people that are coming here, if God is telling them to be here, then thank God I don't have to be responsible for them. What do you mean? See, Jesus is your Lord. You're accountable. Now, I have to do in this ministry what I'm called to do. And in that, yes, we're all flowing together. But I'm not in charge of your life. Yeah. Yeah. There's no change to keep you here, and there's no something we're doing to draw you in. It's God doing his rearrangements like he wants them. And if we are obeying God, then all things are functioning and working well. But if we are learning to be divided, to be angry, to be hostile to where we've been, or to be hostile to where we're going, or to be angry at everything around us, then that's the spirit of the world, not the spirit of Christ. Do you understand? In Christ, he's the head of the body, and all the body unifies, and it functions in all of its things. They don't all have to look alike, they don't, but they, learn, they should learn to be of unity of purpose. So, yep, we may have the, uh, uh, separations in, in different things of how we do it, but I want to celebrate with other churches as you reach people and they become part of that mission. And I want to celebrate what we are doing and what God is calling us to do. And, and I don't want it to be a fight between all the groups because that's what the world would love to see us do. We ought not be a fight for the world to watch. We ought to be love for them to be amazed at. They ought to be drawn by what they see. And, and jealous of what they see, you know, and, and just say, why can't I have that? And I love it when somebody says, what is it you have that I don't have? And then surprise, surprise, it's Jesus. <laughs> and then it all happens. Okay. So he says, nobody has anything except the, the Father who's given it to him. So look at this here. We'll see a few things that kind of represent this. This is James chapter 1, verse 17. James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is where? From above. It's from the Lord and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. So the Father's sending all the good things. You don't do the good things. We were messed up, but he puts within us now the power, the possibility, the directions that good things could happen. And every good thing that, that is going on is 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 turned toward God. It is to his honor, to his glory. Every good thing you've ever learned, every, you know, wonderful people, nice people come and they'll say to the teachers and different ones doing things, you know, great job. You did a great job. You're awesome. And, and, and all that kind of stuff. And we need to know, uh, pray, praise God if you got something. You know, God's doing something that's awesome. I love being a part of it. I love, love being a part of it. But, but understand, because if you go, oh, well, <laughs> yeah, what'd you expect? <laughs> hey, it's me. If you get to that place, then you're diminishing what God can do. Because once you start, I, I remember when Terrence Moore gave his testimony. Anybody remember when Terrence Moore, he's our guitar player, gave his testimony, and he said the pastor stopped saying Jesus was the way to salvation and started saying he was. And, and see, a lot of us in the world don't even know that's happening in religious circles. And it's happening in, 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 in places like he said. And sometimes they just don't say it, but they live like it is so. They may not say they are the way of salvation, but they make it seem like you better do what I tell you to do. You know? And, and I just don't see 
Jesus, I see Jesus saying he is Lord and, and needs that kind of place, but I don't see him making you do it. No more, you know, just like we were reading, you can lead that horse to water, you can't make it drink. And, you know, when, Jesus, when, when the Bible says that nobody comes to God except God draw him, but it's not by violence. That is not a violent word. He draws, but you have to enter. You have to have faith. You have to say yes. And, and that's our God. And every good thing that happens, everything that we see being accomplished is to his glory, to his credit. Uh, I've seen many times that people put a pastor up on a pedestal and then something happens with that pastor and then people start falling away. Now see, if Jesus was on the pedestal, if Jesus was the one being worshipped, anything could happen to that pastor, you'd be just fine. You'd be just fine. Ministries, leaders, whatever. If Jesus is in the right place, we're all going to survive and do just fine. But if the leader is, then you go with the leader. If he falls away, many people fall away right well. I'm not going to church anymore. You know, they, they did this, he did this, whatever. I, I believed in a man once. Oh, you should have believed in Jesus forever. <laughs> and not a man once or, or somebody who's going to hurt you enough to leave Jesus. Well, then somebody's got the wrong place. Nobody should hurt you enough that you would leave your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. All right, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. There are diversity of gifts, but the same what? So diversity of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries like we were just talking about. There are differences of ministries, but what? The same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, all the things we see going on all around the world, how the church is moving, how the Spirit of God is doing things. But it is the same God who works all in all. Isn't that amazing that in this verse we get to see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all together? You see, the Spirit pouring out the gifts, Jesus, the Lord of the house, God, the one who made the house the creator, the designer of the house, Jesus, the Lord of it, and then the spirit who is the one passing out the gifts or the, 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 the go-between go man, the one who is doing the drawing, the passing out, and telling you to get to the party. And so all those are in the same thing, and that is happening throughout. So we're not all going to be the same, and if you're trying to make it that way, you're going to be unhappy for a long time. In the body of Christ. We are not all the same. We will not do things all the same. We ought to appreciate the differences, the, the diversity that the Spirit has created. And, and we need to learn to figure out how to move, how to walk, how to appreciate, how to be involved in it. There are differencing of ministries, so things will rise up in those groups of ministries that will not all be the same. I, I, I don't care how it is. You want one place to be exactly like the other, I'm telling you. How are you going to do it? God has brought a diversity of people with every, every unit, and they're producing a certain thing. If you try to rubber stamp that every church is going to be alike, uh, you know, every ministry is going to be alike, it, you're just not going to be able to do it. God is, is too unique for that. It's not going to be that way. And then all of it working together is a God design. It's all designed by God. And so God is in it from, from beginning to end. Those that are rising up, those that are coming down, those that are being created, everything uh, it involves God's heart. And then uh, Romans, go to Romans uh, 12, chapter, uh, verse 6. And having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Now, now, let's pause right there. Remember, I've said that grace isn't just a word. Grace is a person. And the person's name is Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Grace is that's why the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Grace. Now watch. This says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. What did Jesus give to us? Yes, that's right. He poured out his Holy Spirit onto us. Now it says, through Jesus came grace. What did he give us? He gave us the Spirit because it's the Spirit of Grace. Watch this. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Now go back to the other verse. Go back to the other verse right there. There are diversities of gifts, same thing, but the same what? 
Because it's the Spirit of grace that is pouring out all the things that are manifesting around us. Therefore, I can't do the things of God until I accept Him and the Spirit begins to work in me. Then if I do the, the work that He's called me to do, Paul says it's not me, but the grace that God has given me. And we can only do as much as the, the grace or the Spirit is working out in us. Therefore, it's the Spirit who engages us to the Lord. It's the Spirit who is directing us to the Lord. And, it is, and when we get there and the Spirit's job is done, it is called being saved by what? Grace. grace. Because the move of the Spirit. Therefore, we do not want to quench the work of the Spirit. Therefore, we do not want to have... A, a grace in vain because it's the spirit of God that everybody's working with and that activity of the spirit is called grace if I fulfill that which God has called in me it is called grace being seen or the fulfillment of the spirit doing his work if I am not doing it then we don't see the spirit doing doing what he's there for and so everything is connected to that and the spirit is the grace and grace is the spirit. And you can just see that there. All right, go to the next one. Uh, th therefore, differing in gifts according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. All right, go to the next one. This is, uh, he, well, let, actually, let me read this. Verse 28, back in, in John chapter 3, verse 28. John continues on. He says, You yourselves bear me witness that I have said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. So he says, I've already said it. That's what I said there in Judea. I'm not the Christ. You've heard me saying this. He's talking to his own disciples. He said, but I've been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because, the bridegroom's, because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. So he's saying the friend of the bridegroom is there to hear or respond to the bridegroom's voice. And that gives joy uh, to the friend of the bridegroom. And he says, now my joy has been fulfilled. All right, let's look at this for just a little bit. We just had a wedding. That's what the flowers there. I hope it's surviving. But this was yesterday. We had a, had a wedding here. And... Uh, uh, Joe Lewis and Sarah Lowe got married, so now they're Mr. and Mrs. Joe Lewis. And, uh, and we got to be a part of that. And, you know, you got to see the whole group. And what is John talking about when he says the friend of the bridegroom? Talking about the best man, that's right. It's the best man. Hey, this is pretty cool. John's saying, I'm the best man of Jesus. <laughs> oh boy! I, I, I'll say it now because I might forget to say it. Remember what Jesus said about John. He said, "There's nobody greater than John, born of a woman. Nobody greater. He's the best that we could produce without a savior. Right?" He's the best we could produce without a Savior. And that man became the best man to Jesus. So the best we could do was the best man to Jesus. And one of the duties of the best man, we're, we're going to talk about it, is to present those that Jesus is after to the bridegroom. But you know what happens when that happens? The bridegroom grows into the chamber yeah, the, the bridegroom goes into the chamber and the bride goes with him and the door is shut. And guess where the best man is? He's, not, he's outside. He's not in the room. Remember, Jesus said John was the greatest born of a woman, but the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So the best man can only bring him to the door, but only the bride can go in the door. And when that door is closed... You've just become greater than the best the world can offer. Well, that was good preaching, whether you knew it or not. That was good, good preaching. That's, that's what God offers us. That's what God says. 
that even the best that the world produces, if you are the bride of Christ, you have stepped into something greater than the best they could do. The least in the kingdom is greater than that. So here's the best man, and here's what a best man is in this process. It's not like our best man today. Best man doesn't have to do a whole lot today, but the best man had to do a lot back then. Because when, when the wedding's going to happen and, and there's a planning for the wedding, there comes a moment in a time where the bridegroom disappears. Where did the bridegroom go? Anybody know where the bridegroom went? Where, 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 where would the bridegroom go? This is, I'm talking about old times. Go to the father's house. That's right. The bridegroom would, would go to the uh, father's house. And what were they doing in the father's house? They're preparing. They're preparing the chambers. They're preparing everything. The whole house is being prepared for an event. Everything is getting ready for all the people that are going to come. Everybody that's going to be celebrating this. And for the bride to be able to come into this this thing all prepared for her and the, the chamber and the room that is going to be there. And this party is going to go on for days and days and people will come. But they're not going to talk to the bridegroom. They're not going to talk to the bride because the bridegroom and the bride are going to be in the chamber. Remember, Jesus was invited to a wedding. And he comes to the wedding, but he didn't talk to the bridegroom. He talked to all the officials that were running the party because the, the bridegroom and the bride are in the chamber. Okay? And so this is a big event, and there's lots of planning. And, and when it's getting close, the bridegroom disappears. And, and you just know something's going to happen sometime in the future. So he can't go and do business. He can't go and do all that. Who does all that for him? The best man. The best man will take information and will be in charge of making sure information that the bridegroom and the father are trying to get out is getting out. So they'll have an invitation. And they send out an invitation, come to the wedding, come, come be a part, come. And so the best man has to make sure the invitations are going out, that it's going out. And, and did you get your invitation? You know, because it's going to be coming, so be ready. Don't be caught unaware now, just be ready. Remember the teaching of the ten virgins? Five were foolish. Why were they foolish? Because they got the invitation. They had oil. They were ready. But for five of them, their oil went out. And then they made a calculation in their head. And they said, it'll be all right. I'll do it later. I'll get oil later. It won't be today. I want to play today. I want to be lazy today. I don't have to do it today. And then, boom, the wedding party is going to happen. The announcement comes. They weren't ready. Now they said, well, I should have been ready. And, and they want to try to buy oil. What's the point of the, of the parable? They did not honor the bridegroom. They were not ready. In, in the culture, there was an anticipation. As, as, the, bride, uh, as the best man would go and, and do service for him, what, what do you want? Tell the community this, you know. And he could give out hints. It's, it's getting close. We're getting close. We're almost ready. Be ready. And, 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 and the community loved it. It was a celebration. And whenever that moment came, they didn't know when it was going to be. So when Jesus is saying, no man knows the day or the hour, what is he talking about? What they knew in the culture was the wedding day. Nobody knows the day or the hour, but when it comes, you're supposed to be ready. Ooh, there you go. You're supposed to be ready when that moment comes. And and so he's telling them and, and getting them ready. And when that moment came and they heard it, it didn't matter what time it was, what time of day, what time of night. The whole community knew that soon it was going to happen. And they all start coming out. And they come out with their lamps, their lights, and, and they're going down the main street. They're all celebrating. They're all joining in the crowd. They're all going down to the, where the wedding's going to happen. And they all come into the place and the gates and doors are shut and all that. And that's the reference that those who were late because they were not on time do not get to go in. And, and, and that's a reference to what they understood as part of the wedding practice. And so the best man is making sure, getting the word out, doing the business that he would like them to do, telling everybody, encouraging everybody to be a part and then when it happens and they're all coming and people are coming, the best man's so happy. Everything worked out. Everybody was on the ball. People are coming. They're all coming to be involved. And, and the last steps is something we don't really understand. 
in our culture because we do it differently. But it's the best man who in the end takes the bride and brings the bride right up to where the, the groom is at. It is the best man who stands at the door when the door is shut and says, is everything okay? And the bridegroom, with now the bride, says everything's all right. And the finale of it comes. And what does the best man do? He's happy. He rejoices for the bridegroom because the bride is with him now and he's done his job. Come on, you got me? And John says, you want me to fight this ministry of Jesus? Are you kidding me? I'm getting happy because I, now they are shifting from me to him. Now what has been stirred up, me getting everybody ready, I was the voice to prepare the way. They're not supposed to make home with me. They're supposed to make home with him. And so now the best man is happy. He's, he's brought them. He's heard the bridegroom's voice and my joy is fulfilled. He has brought them all to Jesus. And when we had taught this uh, the first time in John, I told you we are the voice. All of us are the voice in the wilderness. We are calling to the world. We are telling them, get ready. We are part of that. You know, I said, we are the John the Baptists to this, to this world. And, and also, now with this reference, we are also the best man. It is our goal not to bring people to us, but to be there making sure everything is working out just like it should for the bridegroom. And it's our joy to see that worked out. That's why if we take the glory away from him, can you imagine that the best man takes the wife away from... Wouldn't that like the, isn't that like the lowest, right? And sometimes you see stories about that. But what is the duty? It is to have a joy that he gets his beloved. And so any of us that are called into ministry, any of us that are part of it, it is definitely not to draw anybody to ourselves. It is to draw everybody to, we're saying and we are speaking and announcing that which God has put in our heart and then we take them and direct them to Jesus, away from ourselves. Do you, do you understand? And, and so, uh, you know, that's why we say stuff like, uh, uh, you know, crossroad is not your answer. The God of crossroad is. Anything, you know, that's why don't put the, the leaders up on a past pedestal. You put Christ on his right place and, and work with that. So this is John talking about that. And let's look at it quickly, a few scriptures that fit that. This is Hebrews chapter 3, verse 3. For this one, Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. So the house that we're talking about, that we are in, God has formed. Remember the Bible says, do you not know you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Not, we're not individual temples. We're all part of the temple. You know, he, he is taking, our, every one of us is a brick of this new building. You know, God's putting it together. He has formulated it. So, and Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a, What? Servant. He was a servant in the house. He wasn't in control of the house. He was a servant and he was faithful for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterwards. We know he was faithful in everything he was asked to do. He did it and he, he was honored for that. But he was a servant. Uh, continue on here. But Christ as a son over his own house. You see, Christ is the Lord of the house. There's one body and there's one head. Who's the head? Who's the body? We are. So that's the house. He's in charge. You see, Jesus came. He honored his father. He did his will. He died on the cross, was dead and buried. God raised him from the dead, gave him a name, which is above every name, Lord, that everybody would now confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. So he has moved from simply the son raised in the house to being the Lord of the house. And in that position, it says, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, we are part of that house. And aren't you glad when you see ifs? Yep. If. If we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm until the end. See, all those that are his are not those who come and leave. All those that are his are those that remain 
firm until the end. doesn't mean you don't have problems or you, you don't have uh, a moments that you would fall back, but yet you, you do not forsake his lordship of your life. You see, those that know he is Lord come back and confess to him. He's faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Once again, that, that's still wedding talk. The, the one, you know, he says he is married to the backslider. It's not that the marriage has happened in the reference that he's talking about, but he, he keeps the engagement even though you're trying to break it. You're doing activity that looks like you're trying to break it. He'll be faithful. You come back to him. You don't have to worry about his attitude toward you. You need to be worried about your attitude toward him. See, he is faithful to that. That's, that's why we call him faithful, and we haven't even got there yet. He is faithful. When we get there, he calls us faithful. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And so the Spirit's job is to get us there, to walk us in that journey, and all those that are his will stay on that journey until the end. It's all those who endure that receive the promise, not those who start. And that's, that's that whole reference. Because those who are truly saved will do the journey. We may say we are, but if we won't do the journey, we aren't. All right, uh, go to the next one. This is John chapter 5, verse 22. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Interesting, because we just talked about this, that Jesus said, I, didn't, I wasn't sent to judge, I was sent to save. You know, so he says, the purpose of the Father is to save, not to have me set up as a judge. But I will be set up as a judge, and he says, I will judge properly because I'm not going to say what I want to say. I'm going to say what the Father tells me to say. Now, here's the Father saying, I'm not going to judge. I've committed that to the Son. But yet the Son who says, well, I'm, I, my judgment is going to be right because I'm not going to do what I want to judge. I'm going to do whatever the Father says. This is an amazing thing that, that we can learn about unity. The unity of something where, where God and the Son are unified is they both keep esteeming others higher than themselves. They keep giving it to one another. I'm giving it to the Son. The Son says, I'm giving it to the Father. And you know what? It all works out. You want to have a great marriage? Then why don't you just esteem each other higher than yourselves? You know, I've never had people come in and sit on my couch and say, Pastor, we got a problem. She keeps esteeming me higher than herself. And I... <laughs> And I keep esteeming her higher than myself. I think we're going to divorce. <laughs> Never heard it. Because those people love one another. Those people get along. Those people grow. Those people just keep bound. And everybody wants to be around them. Everybody wants to be involved in their life. Because those people love each other. They're learning how to be like God. You know, so even though Christ is going to judge, yet he gives all the credit to the Father, even though the Father says, I've appointed it, it gives all the credit to the Son. And then look what it says. That all, why, why is all this happening? That all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. In other words, the two are one. This resurrected Jesus who has become Lord and now set on the throne, they are totally to be treated as if you're dealing with the same person. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now, remember, Jesus prayed and says, Lord, thank you. I'm going back to the glory that I did have. So he's being restored back into that kind of unity. And then he said, and Lord, I, I pray for them too, that as you and I are one, they will be one with us. I and you, you and me, we and them. It's, it'd be the same thing. So is it any wonder when we get there on our wedding day, all the stuff he has, they're trying to give to us? Isn't, it, isn't that amazing? That all the things that God has, when we get there, he's trying to gift it toward us. Gives us a new name. Gives us his house. Gives us a seat at the throne. Puts a scepter in our hand. All those type of things. It's an awesome picture that, that we see over and over in the writings of John. All right, let's look at the last one here. This is in uh, Revelation uh, chapter 19, verse 6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. Why? For the marriage of the Lamb has come. This is the thing we've been waiting for since the beginning. <laughs> This is the uniting of God with man. The marriage is happening. The, the trump is being sound. The dead are being raised from the dead. Those that are living are coming and being apart. Everybody, the, the, the moment has happened. 
Now everybody's coming in in celebration. It's a great multitude. Sounds like thunder in there with all the voices. And they are saying, this is it. This is the marriage of the Lamb. The celebration is going on. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready. The wife has made herself ready. The wife has said, I'm going to present myself with something that is pleasing to my Lord. I'm telling you, man, the bride came down yesterday. She, she's awesome, just dressed up pretty. I was sitting, I was standing beside Joe. He's probably going, mm-hmm. She's just like, awesome. She's, she's giving herself to me. That's just an awesome thing, you know, when you think about it. You know, it, you know, I was there with Joe, but I was thinking about back on my day, you know. It's just awesome. That's an awesome thing. The bride has made herself ready to come and be presented to the one who has made the call. And, and if she's made herself ready, that means she honored the bridegroom. Right? She didn't let her oil go out. She was ready for the call. She was ready for this moment. Now watch. Go to the next verse. And to her was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. She's made herself ready. And she's been granted to, this is what the look is. It's amazing. She's made herself ready, but it's been granted. So the two work together. I can only do that which God empowers me to do. And look, she's arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the faith of the saints. How about that? I'm telling you, God knows what he's talking about. What is it that makes the bride pleasing to the sight of the bridegroom? When he sees that she has done righteous acts that look like him. That's the one who was ready to come before the Savior. That's the one who was ready to come to her bridegroom. Yes, I heard your message. Yes, you gave me power to be. And yes, I imitated who you were. I learned of you because I was coming to your house. I was giving up my house and I'm going to your house. And I prove it by what happened. James said, don't tell me about your faith. Show me your faith by what you do. It is not those who talk about their love for Christ. It is those who live their love for Christ. And Christ will look at it and be pleased that you are covered with the acts that God inspired and empowered in you. Not your fruit to be proud of. You were granted to do the fruit. You were granted to be part of the ministry. You were granted to be able to do the works of God. You couldn't produce the works. You are now connected to Christ, and that vine then produces the fruit of the Spirit. And both the Father and the Son are happy with that branch. You are arrayed in His beauty. And that branch is going to stay and produce even more. The branch that says, I am there, but produces no fruit, the Father says, no, you're gone. You're gone. And was not granted to be arrayed, was not granted to be a part of the bride. The bride knows who they are. The bride knows they have been engaged. The bride lets the spirit lead and do what they want. And the bride is fulfilling the very works of Christ because she was created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And so if you know Jesus, you're involved with Jesus. You don't sit around. The gifts you're given are to be used. They're to be involved. The things that God has called you, then you do ministries and all that. The activities God has given you, you do all the activities. But those gifts, they came from the Holy Spirit. That ministry, it was ordained by the Lord Jesus Christ. And those activities is by the Father who planned all in all. And when we show up with those things that He did on us, we are beautiful to his eye. We are like a holy Jerusalem that he is going to house himself with us forever. We are streets of gold. We are rubies. We are every fine stone. We are everything that's beautiful to God. We are gates of pearl. 
We are the 12 names of Israel. That We are the 12 names of the apostles. Every believer in there. The angel measured that city, and it was 12, 12 thousands. That's where we get the number of 144 thousand it's not separated that like some kind of number we're trying to have no it's a number that is a picture of the saints themselves every believer from all time who honors god is part of the holy city the bride of christ and that city is the hundred and forty four thousand it's every believer it's everyone that pleases his heart it's everyone that he called and they listen it's everyone who filled with the spirit and did the works of the lord and they come down and are presented to him and his heart is glad to receive us and give us everything that he has isn't that awesome it's awesome what god has for us Woo! all right one last verse he says this, to end all that that John was saying, he ends with this, he must increase, but I must decrease. He said the bridegroom, the best man gets happy for the bridegroom. And it's not about us increasing, it's about us diminishing while he increases. If you've got a true, wonderful uh, call, a ministry, an activity that God has ordained, you will see Christ exalted and, and us diminished. That, that Christ is the answer. And I just, I'll just end with this, and I hope you can understand this. In John's gospel, what we're reading right now, we never hear the phrase John the Baptist. Never hear it. Never hear John the Baptist. We only hear John. Every time we were looking at it, we only saw John, not John the Baptist. How is it that in John's gospel, John becomes the name for John the Baptist? And there's only one reason. Because John, the writer of the gospel, never says his own name. And all the others, as they said John, they had to separate John from John the Baptist. So it became John the Baptist. In John's gospel, he gives John, the man who he was a disciple of at one time, who he feels honored the Lord with his whole life, he gives him the honor of the name John. Gives it to him. Doesn't, doesn't even, and, and then never says his own name about himself. I believe he talks about himself when he says the disciple whom Jesus loved. It's the disciple whom Jesus loved that is walking there behind Peter. When Peter's told he's going to go to the cross, he said, what about him? He said, what is that to you? If he lives for a long time, what is that to you? And I think John put that in there because John was the only one who wasn't martyred by that point. So he put in there, you know, Jesus even acknowledged I wasn't going to be martyred. But, but the question was, what is that to you? You serve me. See, that's what we've been talking about. What, what is that for me to say something else about another ministry? We need to serve how God is calling us to serve. It, it's that same thing. It, it, was, it was that disciple whom Jesus loved that he was told that Judas was the betrayer. You know, uh, it, it was him that was told that. There's many key places and John didn't talk about himself except to reference it like that. I know some people believe that that, dis that was some other mystery disciple and, and something else. Uh, you know, I, I don't believe that. I, I believe it was John referencing himself. Uh, you know, if there was some mystery disciple, it's amazing to me that John never told within one thought in his own gospel that happened to him. And the other disciples never, ever mentioned the mystery disciple. You know, so... So I, I don't even go there with people because I'm saying, li listen, this, this is what they did in that culture, and, and so John's applying that. But here's what I want you to see. Is it possible that the man that lived in the Spirit and was the longest living apostle that knew the teachings that John said, I must increase, I mean, I must, he must increase and I must decrease, that knew all that, learned how to apply it to his own self also, and even in his own gospel, he was more busy exalting everybody else and keeping himself out of the frame, you know. And I really believe if we could just get close to God's heart, if we could get close to who Jesus was, then the same thing could happen to us. The more we know him, the better we do. The more Christ increases and the more we decrease. And we wait for that day that when we've done all that he says, we are happy. 
We're happy for people to come to Christ. We rejoice when they raise their hand. We love to help them and strengthen them so that they are totally given to Christ. And I'm glad that's what we're about. I'm glad that we're learning to be about that. And I hope you are, are totally understanding that, you know what, let's be like that voice in the wilderness. Let's be like that best man. And let's be happy when people are given to Christ and not to us. Amen? Amen. Why don't you stand? <laughs> Woo! All right. And you may be here, and you may not know Jesus as Lord and Savior. He may be wooing you, drawing you right now. And uh, this may be your moment, your time. Let me just give you a word. Now is the time. <laughs> this is the day of salvation. Uh, it's when he calls, when he woos, not putting it off to another time. Because why is that? Because you're not in charge of that. He is. So it's when he does it is when you should respond, when you should say yes. As you're saying yes, you are saying no to your life. You're saying, Lord, I give you who I am. You're in charge from here on. You agree that you're entering into something that he is Lord of. And in that, he begins to move. He empowers you with his presence. He begins to change your life. He will lead and guide you to places that you could never imagine, growing in the knowledge of who he is. The very creator of the universe has come for you. And if that's you today, then I'll lead you in a prayer of committing your heart, your life, everything to the Lord. I guarantee you, your brothers and sisters that have been there are going to be happy for you. They'll rejoice with you, and they'll support you by saying the prayer. But you have to be bold in front of men and women and, and be able to confess and say, it's me, Pastor Rick. God's drawing me, and, and I just want to receive him, confess him today. So if that's you, brother, sister, be bold. Raise that hand. We'll say this prayer with you, committing your heart and life and everything to the Lord. Anybody in the room that needs that prayer, and then raise your hand up high, and we'll say this prayer with you. Anybody in the room? Okay, I don't see any hands. Then I'm going to trust and believe you have done that. Okay, church, you know what we got? Seven days. seven days. Awesome seven days we can have when we're out there being his best man, making sure that what he's asking is being done. Let's walk in the power of his spirit. That means uh, righteousness is growing. He is increasing in our life. And that darkness, things that are not him are being diminished out. That's who we are. That, that, that's, that's what we're about. So let it be taking place. Pay attention when you wake up. Speak to him and say, Lord, what are we doing today? Let him have his way because I guarantee you in seven days he can run somebody by you that you need to touch, minister to, pray for, witness to. There is stuff for his servants to do. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your mercy on our lives. Thank you that you have poured out such a great love to us. And thank you that uh, the word we have read has encouraged us in you. Lord, that we can be that voice in the wilderness, calling to those that do not know you to prepare the way. Thank you for the, the attitude that we would draw people to you and not to ourselves. And thank you, Lord, that everything that we do, we can only give you honor and glory for it. For every good gift is from you. Every good thing that happens in ministry is from you. And everything you're doing in each uh, of us as individuals that is producing this kind of life is only from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and our Father and the Holy Spirit. And we give you thanks, honor, and glory for it. Now touch people this week, Lord with your sons and daughters, and we'll give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated.